We're here at the end of Negan, right? Negan's, Negan. 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 With an N. Negan session. Negan. Drop. I was hoping to do that a little bit different, but it worked. So when the dog has an object in his mouth, we want to call it a low value item. Now he has raw hides, which I explained to the guardians. I'm not a fan of raw hides. They're soaked in bleach ammonia, a lot of other chemicals, and because dogs ingest them, they lead to a lot of health issues. Um, I would let him chew the ones he has here, just stop getting them. Instead of, get, uh, instead of getting those, get bully sticks or kneecaps or tracheas or chicken's feet or other things that we think are kind of weird. But again, I give you that card to go to the green spot, which will get you $5 off. And if you mention you're one of my clients, it might give you a cow's ear or some, some stuff as well. So we want to get high value uh, adjustable items. This is his roadmap to success. And I'm going to, uh, like I said, for, well, let me go back up. So when he has an object in his mouth, a drop command. When he has something he has in his mouth, not he's holding it here, but he's got it in his mouth, hold the treat up against his nose and just wait. Don't give him any prompting. He'll try to take it with the object in his mouth. Wait. As soon as he drops it, pop the treat in his mouth and say the word drop. So when we practice with low value items, things that he's allowed to have at any point, then when he steals a shoe or something he's not allowed to have because he is a bit of a thief, we say drop, he spits it out, ready to get the treat. Now, when you do this, once he drops it, pop the treat in his mouth and don't go for the object right away. For a low value item, matter of fact, Matter of fact, you pop the treat in his mouth after he drops to say the word drop and don't pick it up at all. So he's like, so you asked me to drop, I drop something, you give me something amazing and then I get the thing back or written that I read in the beginning? Sure, that's a deal. So, and then when eventually when he does, we have to take a shoe or something away, we might give him a bully stick or something else as a trait so he's getting equal or greater value. Now I mentioned the green spot, which is my favorite store to go to in here in Omaha. Um, again, bring that card in. Talk to them about your dog food. Right now we're feeding eyes. I'm pretty sure it's got corn and wheat or other grains. Dogs can only absorb about 10% of grains. So it literally is more poop that you're producing out of your dog. They cannot eat it uh, and ingest it. They can eat it. Uh, or they can't digest it is a better way to put it. But it, I've spelled him, uh, it gives him gas. And also it creates, like I said, more poop in your backyard. So tell them what your price point is. And they'll have a whole bunch of types of food that you've never heard of that are better quality, that are not going to give your dog gas. What I like to do, and a trick I learned from the green spot, is to pick a brand. I feed my dogs a Kana. So each time I go, I get a different flavored bag. This one, it's, it's like, I think, uh, pork and squash or pork and pear. And then I might get an Atlantic. And then I might get chicken the next time. So that way he has variety every time he's eating. Now, I'm gonna go a little bit backwards in this one because he is uh, he does not do a good job of eating unless he has his food doctored. Now, this is, I think, a result of having his food doctored and having too much access to it. So I went through a structured way of feeding him, which means that we eat first, the human who's feeding eats first because dogs eat in the order of their rank. Once he's fed, then, uh, once we're fed, and if we're not gonna eat a real meal, just go ahead and uh, put a, uh, a, grab a chip or a cracker, something you can eat in five more bites. And then basically, as soon as he, uh, we get done, we give him permission to eat. As soon as he goes and sniffs the bowl, he's on the clock. He has three minutes. But if he leaves the area, I pick up the bowl, dump the food that's remaining out of the bowl, put it back down, drop. So when he's running by with an object, that's a great way to practice the drop. And again, I didn't go for it. He's going to pick that up, hopefully, and run around again. Uh, we'll give him another opportunity to practice. Um, so basically, he's pounding around the room. He's, he's feeling really good about himself right now. He's showing off. Drop. Now, I think um, before, uh, let me go back to the green spot. So for the green spot, we want to basically get him a bunch of, uh, like I said, uh, ask them for the different things. But uh, different, flavor, different food will help uh, getting him some ingestibles. I would also like to get, see him getting bully sticks as opposed to the raw hides. Um, and then giving him all these different <coughs> items that he can have that are ingestible. We don't give them to him all at once, but if we have a guest come over and he's being a nuisance, we give him a rawhide, or not a rawhide, a bully stick or a kneecap. Well, I would jump up on the guest right now, but I gotta instead go and get some good serious chewing in. And he goes off and he's distracted properly. Um, let me see, um, uh, I, went off, I went through off camera a number of exercises. One of them was my technique to stop the dog from getting overexcited or jumping up on a guest when they first arrive. If your jo dog jumps up on a guest when they first arrive, that's a way of the dog saying either you belong to me or I'm claiming you as my property or I want you to know I'm in charge around here. So we can't allow him to do it. What we did instead, we put him on a leash, we had someone stepping on the leash, and then the person stayed just right outside of his reach. Remember when you're doing this to stay sideways to the dog so the dog's facing me. I'm turned away from the dog. As soon as the dog calms down, I turn and I start going lower underneath to engage with the dog. And as soon as the dog gets up or starts waggling, it shows any excitement, I step back outside of the dog's reach and I turn sideways again. This will give you, uh, afford you an opportunity to get a lot of backs and forth, but you wait for the dog to settle down himself. Do not tell him to sit or lay down or anything. 
when he sits and he's calm, then I engage with him. When he gets up or he shows excitement, then I lose interest. Um, another exercise we went over was, a, was a, uh, a leave it exercise, which he did a really good job at. And I think it's gonna be really beneficial in this house because he does like to steal things. And so if we can actually have a strong command that we develop where he can actually leave things alone and expect to get a different reward, that's gonna really help solve a lot of problems before they actually kick in. Now, uh, for the leave it exercise, I'd like to have each person practicing that with him once a day uh, in each house. He lives in basically two houses. And so do it in different parts of the house. Well, for the leave it exercise, I would do it maybe five to 10 treats. Uh, for the, uh, let me see, what are the other, uh, for the drop, we don't, we're not gonna drop a whole bunch. We're just gonna take advantage when he has objects in his mouth. Just have a treat or two in your pocket, pull it out and give it to him. Just make sure you pull it out before you put it in the laundry. Otherwise you have an interesting mess in your pocket. And don't leave your clothes on the floor, otherwise you'll have holes in your clothes as he's looking for the treats. Um, let me see, what else? Um, we also went over a focus exercise. And we shot a video about that, it's above. I'd like them to practice the focus to every one person in the house, practice that uh, as well. Now in the focus exercise, we have about 12 treats. So we wanna practice that, each person doing it once a day in different parts of the house. Now again, within a week, I want you to get up to the point where it's one second, 20, 15 to 20 seconds on that second movement, and, uh, inside as well as outside. And so practice a bunch. Uh, if everybody's practicing once a day, it shouldn't take very long. Let me see, what else do we go over? Uh, we went over um, the importance of rules. The Guardians recently just started to have some rules here, uh, actually at both houses, but for a while the rule was just here that the dog wasn't allowed to be on the furniture, and the Guardians came to the conclusion that was confusing the dog, which it is. So we want to have uniform rules in both locations so he understands I have to be in the same behavior here than there. So some of the rules, not being allowed on the furniture, uh, not being if he, uh, the, the camera person here, he likes to sleep with, and he should only be allowed to do that after 30 days or as long as the problem's going on. And when that comes to pass, only when she invites him onto the bed. So if he gets on the bed without permission, we're gonna touch his nose with a treat, drop it on the ground, like the leaving the room command that I showed the guardians off camera. And this time when he get on the bed to lick it up, we would say the word off. Um, and if he keeps on doing that, we might actually have to go in the room and close the door and not allow him into the room. Uh, but basically, he needs to understand that eventually this is her, the guardian's bed and I'm allowed to be on the bed when the guardian gives me an invitation and it's for only good behavior. It's a privilege, not a right. Other rules would be not allowed to be within seven feet of a human who is eating or preparing food. So not being allowed in the kitchen when we're preparing food, but the rest of the time I could be there. Being around here is fine, fine as long as there's not, not a human eating food. Now, if the guardian's, if he is breaking a rule, one of, oh, and the last rule, uh, and we could look for other rules as well, but another rule would be uh, he has to sit before we let him in or out of the door. So I go to the door and I tell him to sit once. If he doesn't sit within about three seconds, then I walk away. And I'm only saying command once. The more you repeat a command, the less you mean it. I wait one minute, I go back to the door, and again, tell him to sit. If he doesn't sit this time, I walk away for two minutes. Next time for four minutes, then for eight minutes. Keep doubling the length of time. Use Alexa or Siri or whatever it is so you know approximately what it is. And as soon as you tell him to sit and he sits, open that door like there's remote control in his butt. After a while, he will be conditioned. He will go sit at the door in order to come in or out. Now start with whatever direction he really wants. If he really wants inside, start with him outside. Um, and eventually you can do it both ways. All right, I also, uh, because he likes to charge the door, I talk to the guardians about re reverse engineering. What I do when a dog misbehaves is I ask myself or the client, have you taught the dog how you want it to behave? In that activity. If we have it, then it's our responsibility. So answering the door, what I, well, when I have this situation, what I do is I reverse engineer the activity down to the easiest possible scenario and helping the dog practice each individual step of the exercise in the easiest capacity possible. Only I move the second step when they have the first step down right. And eventually I get done with all the steps and then I can actually do, start adding back the real world elements and work our way back to a real world person that's coming to the door or whatever it is. So uh, for the door, uh, when I, uh, now the exercise I would normally do, since this is a split level house, it would be marching at the dog up and down, and I'm gonna go through the escalating consequences here in a minute. But um, what we would do is maybe teach or condition him to go to a place up at the top. So we're gonna call it podium. So what we're gonna do is every once in a while, we're just gonna toss a treat into that general area. When he walks over and licks it up, we're gonna say the word podium. And so after we practice that enough, then we say podium and he goes to that area expecting to get a treat. And then we could do that, and then when, uh, we could also help practice for that activity. So when we have members of the family that are coming home or coming to visit, instead of just showing up or coming in ourselves because we can, we're gonna call ahead of time. Hey, let's do the door exercise. Okay, great. Person who's here grabs a couple of treats and then sits down and acts like we're watching the TV. The, the uh, family member comes to the door and knocks on the door like, and simulates like they're a guest. We go over to the steps, and if he stays on there, we would give him the treat and say podium, and then start walking down the steps. 
And then when we get to the door, we'd have more treats with us. We just jiggle the deadbolt. If he stays in place, we could toss him a treat, or we could go to the next step, depending on which one, which is more appropriate. But eventually, we're going to go through jiggling the deadbolt over and over until he stays in the top level. Only then do we go jiggling the handle. Then I open the door a crack, and then I open it all the way, and then I open the screen, jiggle the handle of the screen door. Then I open the screen door and invite the guys to come in. And if at any point along this time he starts coming down the steps, we run up the steps at him if we can. That's why I said the podium, I think, will be a little bit easier. Now, um, he's definitely under-exercised, and so I'd like the Guardians to increase his exercise. I gave them a number of uh, the dog walker in this part of town that I've trained, and I think he'd be really well be, uh, well, I think it will really improve his behavior. I'd also like the Guardians to start what I call an exercise journal. Keep a piece of paper or a, t a tablet, and then write down the date, and then write down the time, and the number of uh, r revolutions around the yard with a laser, or the number of fetches, or whatever, number, how long the walk was. And then uh, anytime that he gets in trouble, he bites or nips us. He doesn't bite me, he mouths a lot. Remind me, I'll go through the tips for mouthing. And uh, so we put down those things. And when he does mouth us or gets boisterous or jumpy, we should interpret that as not as he being naughty, but he's telling me he needs more exercise. So we're gonna annotate all these exercises down throughout the day and also any outbursts or problems that he has with the time and whatever details are going along. And then at the end of the day, we're gonna give it a grade, A through F. The next day, we maybe fetch him a little bit more or walk him a little, an extra block or whatever it is. Keep playing with the variables until eventually when he, at the end of the day, he gets a letter A grade. Now we know how much exercise he needs in order to be productive. Now the Guardians, uh, there are other people in the house, but we can have multiple people who are walking him. So we could have a dog walker walk him in the morning, maybe one of uh, the Guardians walks in midday, one of the kids walks in the afternoon when they get home from school, and then one walks in the evening. Um, having us come back or teaching him how to fetch, maybe go to, go uh, go to YouTube and teach uh, Google teaching my dog to fetch. Um, the, developing a strong drop will help with this because a lot of people try to take the ball away from the dog and that creates a desire not to want to retrieve it or drop it. But you might want to Google how to uh, go to uh, YouTube, not Google, and search for how to teach my dog to fetch because that is a great way to burn energy. So if we can take him out and play fetch for 10 minutes and then let him come in and cool down and then take him for a walk, he's going to be a lot, more, a lot easier to deal with. Um, okay, so uh, some of the things that I said I was going to come back to, i got to circle back around. Um, uh, let me see, the escalating consequences. So first, we have four escalating consequences, ways to disagree with a dog. These are best done before the dog does it, or you have to have good timing is maybe a better way to put it. First one we do is we want to hiss one time per incident. And I have 10 hisses. I have level one hiss, like it's a level 10 where I have, <sighs> didn't look up that time, but uh, we want to have nuance in it and only hiss one time per incident. Second thing we do is we abruptly stand up. Remember, when you stand up, your authority goes whatever direction your belly button's pointing. Imagine there's a string from your belt buckle to the dog's collar. The dog's going to move around the room to see, are you talking to me? So wherever the dog moves, keep your hips pointed at him until the dog stops moving. So as soon as the dog stands, sits, or lies down, we take two steps backwards to communicate, that's what I wanted. And then I can go back to doing what I'm doing. That's the second escalating consequence. Standing up abruptly, turning to face the dog, pivoting until he's stationary, and then I take one step backwards, and then pause for one second at the end as a way of putting a period at the end of this dog communication sentence. The third thing I do is I stand up abruptly and march directly at the camera. Now, I didn't want to startle, but the idea for that is actually to startle a little bit. So when we march at the dog, don't stop, but move briskly at the dog. Now, the dog's going to back up, and if the dog still stays facing you, keep marching at the dog. The dog needs to think, I'm going to get run over if I don't go the way. Now, as soon as the dog turns sideways to you or greater, stop. At that point, you want to put your feet together, and then you're going to pivot until you go to the second consequence. You're pivoting until the dog's stationary, stationary, take two steps back, pause for one second, and then go back to what you're doing. The only time that wouldn't apply is if the dog's in a designated no-dog zone. So if I march the dog, he turns sideways right away, but he's not supposed to be in that area, I keep walking and I bump into him until he crosses the threshold. Then I stop, and I take one step backwards, left foot, right foot, and I stop. If he comes forward, I hiss and rush forwards my way and say, no, I don't like that. When he back across the line, I take two steps backwards and I pause again. If he stays still this time, I take another two steps backwards, but I'm keeping my hips pointed towards him. Um, so the more that we do this, the more eventually he's going to figure out where the rules and boundaries are. And if we are using these escalating consequences, the dog's going to see us acting like a leader. And it's going to help them respect us a little bit more. The last consequence I have, I would suggest for him getting a leash version of this, but is what I call a leash timeout. So what I do is I step on the leash, in his case about maybe two feet away, three feet away from where it attaches to his collar. He might throw a temper tantrum and flop around when he does, don't say a word. Well, eventually he'll sit down, but he'll sit as far away as the leash will go. 
I'm going to be able to play this like a banjo string. I mean, as soon as I take my foot off the leash, he's going to feel it and he's going to move away. So what I do is as soon as he sits, and I don't tell him to sit, I'm wanting for him to do it on his own. When he sits, he's saying I'm challenging you less. So as soon as he sits, I take the foot that's on this leash and I slide it to take the tension off of the leash like I did there. I don't tell him to sit though. If he, I tell him to sit, he's following command. If he does it on his own, he's communicating to me. I wait now for him to lay down. When he lays down and he's calm, I'm very suddenly I take my foot off the leash. Now at this point, he's free, but he's still on the leash. And it's dangerous for a dog to run around with a leash attached. He could injure himself. So only do this while he's supervised. But if he starts running after somebody again, as he runs by, you can step on the leash and reapply the consequence. Or if a couple minutes go by and he's being good, then we detach the leash, it's not quid pro quo. But what we're saying is if you're gonna be defiant, you, the consequence is you lose all freedom. First, I'm gonna warn you not to do it by hissing at you. If you do it anyways, I stood up. You did it again, so I marched at you. You did it again, so now you have the leash timeout. Now, the only caveat to the leash timeout, and eventually it'll be stand, or hiss, stand, leash, and then hiss, stand, and then just hiss. Uh, to stand March leash. Uh, anyways, uh, to make a long story short, if he's over under exercise, it's not appropriate to do the leash timeout. If he's running around and he's got too much energy and it's been too long since he's gotten exercise, that is our responsibility to make sure we burn that excess energy for him. To not do that and do this instead would be cruel. So we need to make sure we are taking care of the dog's needs. Um, what was I reminded, I asked you to remind me about? Do you remember? No. Uh, no, that's all right. If we forget anything that we went over the session, I want the guardians to call or text me. I can only help you if you let me know if there's a question or a problem. Usually, I can help with a quick phone call or a text without needing to do it uh, to come back for a repeat session. Now, because he is so dog reactive, I'm hoping that incorporating rules and boundaries, increasing his exercise, and flipping the leader follower dynamic by doing uh, two other things I'm going to talk about in a sec. Um, he's going to start respecting his humans more and feel less like it's his job to protect everyone. But if he continues, we might need to sign him up for our behavior adjustment or bat training classes, which we're going to start offering next month, where we teach dogs how to develop new polite social behaviors instead of lunging at another dog. They turn their head to the side and say, no, I don't want to talk with you. So message me if you're still having a problem in about a month and we can get him signed up for those classes. We just do it for short periods of time. You bring him somewhere. We control the situation, expose him to another dog at a distance where he feels comfortable and help him practice moving away on his own. Now, um, a couple other things. Uh, maintenance is something we call changing the environment. Um, right now, we're in a house that kind of stands above the street, and, it, and it's a split level. So he literally looks down, on the, and he has this wonderful picture window in the front, but he's barking at all the dogs that come by, and that's helping him practice this aggressive behavior. So what I recommend the guardians do, and maybe if we have a sage around that could help us, a sage dude who could help us with this, anyway, we'll side uh, a double entendre. But basically what we do is go to uh, uh, like Kinko's or Office Max. They have a roll of paper and it's three feet wide. And you can get it printed as long as you want. We want to measure the, side, the windows and then on the outside of the window, we're going to tape up these white squares. So the dog, if I run it, we'll go to the window now, I can't see onto the street. And so if I can't see there, then I'm going to get out of the habit of coming over here. And right now he likes to sit in front of this window and practice guarding the home. And every time he barks at a dog that passes by and that dog appears in his mind to walk by, He's going to continue doing it and do it more and more. So we will have to block him. So I would do it. We have the windows here. We also have a window uh, in the one uh, on that side of the house. And in the back, he likes to jump up on the table. So we might need to come up with something that we put on top of the table that prevents him from getting on the table when we're not there to supervise. Because this allows him to look over the fence. Um, let me see. What else? Um, uh, I'm trying to think. I'm thinking. Uh, <laughs> let me see. Um, oh, the two other things I want to go over. Probably the most, some of the most important, probably the two easiest things you can do to train any dog. These are called passive, uh, petting with a purpose and passive training. Now, if he comes up and jumps on me and nudges me or scratches at me or leans on me and I pet him, he's telling me what to do. And if I follow through and pet him, I'm validating, yes, you're in charge of me. So what I want to do is, and have everybody in the family do is next time he comes up and nudges us or barks at us or scratches us, instead of doing what he wants, give him attention, we're giving him a counter order. Sit. When he sits, pet him under his chin and say just the word sit, not good sit, not his name, not a long sentence, just the word sit. And then you can pet him for an hour after that. But we're just going to stop petting him when he demands it for sure. Now if we walk in the room and we see somebody petting the dog and their dog is standing, we're going to assume that they forgot. So we're going to say paycheck. Paycheck just means I think you may have forgotten to pet with a purpose. So the person's petting it should stop petting, say sit. When he sits, pet him under his chin and say the word sit a second time. And then turn to the person who said paycheck and say, Thanks for reminding me, but I actually asked him to sit before while you were in the bathroom. When you flushed the toilet, he stood up, and I continued petting him, and David said that's okay, which it is. 
but we won't realize how often we do it. So don't, so comply if somebody says paycheck, just try to help you out. So, but help each other out. If you see the dog is, is getting petted without a purpose, we need to stop that because only the leader dogs get petted for free. And I think that's part of the reason why he thinks he needs to protect his guardians. Now, uh, even if you want to pet him, ask him to sit. If he's already sitting here, ask him to come and sit over here. Or ask him to lay down. And then sudden, just say the command word. Now, that leads me to uh, one of the last things I'm going to talk about, which is what I call passive training, which is what the dog's going to start doing. He's going to recognize that from, it used to be that I got rewarded for doing the wrong things. Many people train their dogs to misbehave because that's when we give them attention, when we correct them. What we're going to do instead is now when he comes up to us on his own and sits down, it's because we've taught him that if you sit, that's the only way I'm going to pet you. Well, now he's prepaying for his, his touching. So when he does that, we want to make sure we do pet him under his chin and say the word crash for lay down or whatever it is, sit or whatever these command words are. The more that we reward him for desired action and behaviors, the more the dog will start emulating those desired uh, actions and behaviors to get our attention. And now when you have guests come over, the dog goes and sits in front of the guest and your guests are like, oh my God, he used to jump up and they're like crazy, what happened? You're like, of course, we hired David from Dog Gone Problems. He came and showed us how to reward the right things. But now we're teaching our dog manners the same way we teach children. We say, excuse me, before we ask a question. We raise our hand in the classroom in different social, social niceties. We just need to teach our dog the same thing. So um, I have a watchword for this. I call this reward or recognize. So if somebody's petting the dog and we, or somebody says to me, recognize, I look, turn and look at the dog. If he's standing, I'm assuming he just came to me and I missed the opportunity to pet him. Remember, you have three seconds to correct reward your dog. So if somebody else sees that he came to me and, I, and says reward, I look at him. If I said, what did he do? When the person saw him do it, that was one second. When they told me to recognize, that's two seconds. When I asked him back, that's three seconds. Now I've blown the window. So if somebody says recognize, I just turn to the dog and the dog's sitting, I pet him and say sit. If he's lying down, I pet him and say crash or down or whatever it is. If he's standing, I assume he just came to me and pet him and say come. Now, the more that we do this, the more the dog will start offering those behaviors. And one of the things that he doesn't do very well, he's, he does not come on command. Well, now, every time I come to a human, they pet me and I hear the word come. Well, now I'm inclined to want to come. Now, there's one last little trick I'm going to show you to teach a dog to come. I'm holding my arm to the side so you can see him. He is actually over there. It's actually appropriate distance. But you want to hold your forearm parallel with the floor. I don't want to hold it up here or down here. Now, for a dog, before I call the dog, I have my, a treat in my hand with a pretty much a flat hand. Now, when the dog comes to me, if he doesn't sit automatically, I'm going to go in an arc over his head. As soon as he sits down, I'm going to lower it, let him lick it off my hand. I'm going to say the word, come. Remember, anytime he gets a treat, he should hear the command word immediately after the treat comes in his mouth. Now, if I say come to him and he doesn't come, and I repeat come, I'm saying it's okay to ignore it. And actually, I'm training the dog to ignore it. So I'm going to say come once, or the command once, and then if he doesn't come, and before I do it, I'm going to hold my hand out like this. I'm going to hold it here, I'm going to say come. He's not coming. So now I'm going to go like this. Well, this is not making me look very good on camera, buddy. He's <laughs> locking his bones. Okay, well, he's making me look like a liar, but I swear this will work. Right now he's chewing on a bully, uh, on a, on a uh, rawhide, and he's got a big chunk in his mouth, and he's content. But if he doesn't have one of those things, and also, well, that's actually a good little lesson. If he's barking at a squirrel, and I'm saying, come, 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 I'm mad, I'm training him to ignore me. So if he's barking at a squirrel, I say, come, and he doesn't come, the first time I would go over there and put an attached leash, and then he comes with me. I'm going to follow through by proving to him that it's important enough for me to burn the energy to do that. But... If I say, come, and he doesn't come, and then I make a kiss, and I start lowering it, usually the dog will come to you. Let's try that one more time. No, he's like, I got a bull, I got a ride. Well, when he comes to me, I'm gonna, like I said, oh, there you go, hey buddy. No. All right, we're going we're gonna to forego that. But basically, hold your hand up like this. Say it once. If he doesn't come, then make a kissing sound. When he looks at you, start lowering it. Go literally all the way to the floor. I promise you, if he doesn't have a uh, rawhide in his mouth, he will come over to you. When he gets the position you want him to be, then raise it over his head in an arc. Don't just go vertically. Go in, if he's here, go in an arc over his head. And once he looks up for it, as soon as his butt hits the ground, lower it. Let him lick it off, the ground, off our hand. And then tickle him under his chin and say the word, come. So I always like to use that motion because eventually if I don't have a treat and he's not listening, I can do this and he'll come to me. And also we always are tickling him under the chin. So that's at least a little reward he gets even if he doesn't happen to have a treat. 
Okay, um, well, normally I would call the dog over here to, to sign off, but he is content chewing over there. So, uh, and, uh, how do we say it again? Uh, Negan. Negan. This a is Walking Dead. Negan, anybody who's a Walking Dead fan is going to recognize that. I am not a Walking Dead fan. Negan. There we go. We actually will achieve it. So now he gets to where I want him to be. I'm going to let him sniff that I have it in my hand. Go over his head. Let's try you over here, buddy. Let's get you a better camera presence. Come. This is Negan. This is Negan's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trades your dog. Only sometimes you mean it.